good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Ascended Christ broadcast. I am Dr. Timothy Hart. I am the founder and senior pastor of the Church of the Ascended Christ, where we follow Christ right to the throne room. Today, we're going to have a very, very powerful and poignant teaching today. I'm glad about it. I'm glad about it. I'm glad that I've reached this point because uh, as a relationship consultant, we deal with this so regular. You wouldn't believe how regular we deal with it. We deal with it so regular that aside of all the other situations, work-related, um, social situations, brothers, sisters, um, you know, sibling relationships, this is the one. And it's because it is so misunderstood. And so in order to for it to make sense, we have to go straight to the master's table. So before we go, let's let's call him in. Let's call him out. Let's call him out and let's usher all other influences out of the room. Father, we are thankful today because of you. It is you who are responsible for all of the joys in our lives and for all of the things that happen in this universe. We thank you because you are the creator and the origin of all things. We thank you because you're constant and consistent. We thank you because you are have always been what you said you were without a doubt you are our father yet you are our king and we thank you because you are gracious in both and merciful in most and you always consider us before you render your judgment and so we're thankful today that you have not taken us out of the land of the living for our crimes against you and against ourselves. And Father, we'd like to ask you at this time that you would forgive us. If you could, Father, will you forgive us our sins and and help us to understand those things that cause us to trespass? You told us if we confessed it, that you were faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. Not that we can abuse it, as you said in, in Romans 6, that even though you gave grace, we can continue to miss the mark. We follow that, Father, and, and because we follow that, we want to be better people. We want to be the righteous people that you have slated us to be. Help us to remain the light. You told us in the prior teaching that we were darkness at first, but then because of the Lord, we are light. We are the example the world needs to see and help us to live up to that. And so, Father, if you could, will you uh, let that spirit of revelation hover right now and touch everyone who is watching this line? Give them a spirit that they would be ready to receive and understand so that we can improve relationships and be that light that you have made us that we might grow into those things which you have called us and perform in a manner that says that you are with us. And as we go forward, Father, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do because it is by the authority given to me by Jesus that I come and bring this petition and have this audience. And all who agree with this prayer said in their hearts, amen. Now, ah, uh, let us go straight to the scriptures. I have this tendency of trying to fill time. <laughs> I'm going to try to stop that. Just want to come straight. Let's come on straight. All right. Let's go to Ephesians chapter five. <laughs> and notice when we when we go back to yesterday, excuse me. When we go back to yesterday, yesterday ended with the scriptures 
the scripture submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay. Now, poignant, very poignant passage in the fear of God. Very poignant passage. I want you to, I want you to give that some thought because it's real easy to declare yourself in the Lord. It's real easy to declare that when the reality is the look fits the fashion in this line. In fact, it goes back to Jesus saying that a good tree can, can only bring forth good fruit and an evil tree can only bring forth evil fruit. Okay. So if you're in the Lord, the commandment should be easy. Submitting yourselves. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, I'm, I'm going to make myself someone's slave? Does it mean that I'm going to leave myself open for your abuse? Does it say that every your word is going to be my every command? No, it absolutely does not. See, the word submission, if you want to, if you want to liken it to a situation in your life, when you go to pay a bill, okay, there's a request made <clears throat> based on your performance. Are you listening to me? Your performance was you used the service and accepted the benefits of that service. So now they're requesting reciprocation. In this case, the payment. So submission starts in your mind. Your willingness to reciprocate in return. <clears throat> Are you with me? Now, you go down to the office or you put the money order in the envelope and seal it. What you're doing is you're willingly giving to that person that already gave you something. See? And the first thing they gave you is a trust. They turn on your service. They, they, they sent that thing to your house. It was a trust. It was a trust form. And abusing the trust means you don't reciprocate. Are you listening? Now, submitting yourselves, in other words, I'm going to give you because I want to give to you. And then you give back because you want to give back. See, submission doesn't mean uh, you, you do what I say. And that's just all there is to it. No, there has to be an exchange in any type of submission relationship, okay? When you were in school, you were told to submit your homework. What does that mean? Does that mean give the teacher your work, give it to her, willingly give it to her or him. So when the, when the Lord is using this language, what he's saying is be humble and be willing at all times to be of service to someone else. Now, Submitting one to another in this case is, it's not voluntary per se, because the power, remember the power of love constrains you to do things. And because you love someone, this is what you do. If one of your family members was in trouble, you'd get up out of your bed to go. Well, some of us would. Get up out of your bed to go see what's going on with them. Get off your job to see what's going on with them, especially your children, your spouse. Something happens, it's an emergency. You need it done right now. You need to leave, drop what you're doing, and go. And that's because you have submitted to your family members. You submitted to your children. You submitted to your spouse. What, what did you submit? You submitted your time, your attention, your concern, your compassion, your empathy. See, you gave all those things to them because you love them. So submission is never by force. In the law, when you submit something by force, it's called duress. The person making the request doesn't give you any other option. You're going to give it to them or they're going to hurt you. So submission here carries the connotation that I love this person 
And because I love them, I want to do for them. He said, have that attitude all the time. All right. Now, that was general. Now he's going into your house. He's stepping into the house. At verse 22, this is going to be pretty lengthy, but I'm going to try to uh, keep it under, keep it so that you don't fall asleep. Okay. But there's some things we need to say. I might need to do another session. And it starts like this. Let's take them uh, subject, uh, subject by subject. Okay. The first part talks about the women. The second part talks about the men. The third part talks about the co the correlation between the relationship between Christ and his church and how that overlay should overlay this uh, marital, the marital relationship. Okay. Now I have to say at the outstart <clears throat> that marriage is not a relationship. No matter how hard you want to make it that it's not. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Marriage is not a relationship. Why is it not a relationship? Because you don't establish it. <clears throat> you didn't establish marriage. <clears throat> Humans didn't establish marriage. God did. Marriage as an entity belongs to him. So if, if if marriage as an entity belongs to God, it's already perfect. Okay? Are you listening? It's already perfect. But in order to get into it, there are requirements. One requirement is, excuse me, One requirement is that you be male or female. Okay? Are you listening? You got to be alive to get in. Got to be male or female to get in. Okay? Now, the way you get into this institution is you make a promise to stay in it. Oh, y'all not listening. I'm, I'm just going by what the book says. The one that there are one, there's one way you get into this institution, and this is make, to make a promise that you are going to get into and get in there and stay in there. So once you make that vow, God makes the contract permanent by what? Consummating. The evidence that you have consummated is what? Your children. <clears throat> okay. Now. Well, Bishop, how does that relate to the law? Or get to that. So in the Bible, when, I'm th the, when, when it says a man knew his wife, are you listening? A man had intimacy, intimate connections. He consummated the relationship. And that's what made her a wife. So, so many people get the thing twisted and start thinking that, you go to the altar and that establishes the marriage. No, it doesn't. Marriage already been established. You are just entering into it. Just like the church. You don't make the church. You enter into it because it wasn't made by you. So when people talk about my marriage, my mar it ain't your marriage. You have a marital relationship. It's called matrimony. You are participating in a marital relationship matrimony. And what does that entail? That entails a vow, that entails consummation, that entails childbirth, child rearing. Okay? So, we call it marriage, and I'm is not too sure as to what God calls it. Okay? We always, humans always name in something. Okay? Because the word marriage starts with the root word marry. And according to the definition of marry, marry means to rule. If you are, if you have some confusion about that, if 
you have some confusion about that, write to me. I'll put my uh, my email. I'll put my email in. Drop me a line and put marriage in the header, and I will give you the information that tells that's telling you exactly this one thing. Marriage doesn't mean I make this promise to you, you make this promise to me, and we live forever. No, marriage is a legal term in the Jewish faith that means to rule. And it's spelled B A apostrophe A L. Fail. It's weird. When I started doing the research, it blew me away. It blew me right out of my seat. It took me a couple of days before I could even go back to read about it. So all this time, failed marriages are because people misunderstood that very term. So let's keep it moving. Okay. The word marriage, the word marry in the Hebrew means to rule. Okay. Which is why we understand now, I understand now, why it's important for the woman to submit to the man. Now, let's go right to the scriptures. Verse 22 from chapter 5. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. Now, <clears throat> this command is very specific. And remember something. God is not dealing with your emotional state. God's not dealing with your trauma. God is not, in this case, God is not dealing with any of those things that cause you to have the opinion you have about men. So let's let's just erase that right now. He's saying it's very general. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands in the same manner that you would submit to the Lord. Now, if you are not fully submitted to the Lord, then you don't understand what this means. Submission to the Lord is not a transient concept. Submission to the Lord is something that you do, wake or sleep, alive and well or alive and not well you do it despite what you think about it you do it despite what you believe about it you, you do it in such a way that if god whispers in your ear go do something you drop what you're doing and you go do whatever he says nothing takes precedence over what god says nothing not how you feel not what your parents feel not what your kids feel not what your friends feel okay so why is this important? Because the modern woman of today is wrestling with that idea of submission because she's gotten submission mixed up with the rest. See? It because submission, it, it is a fine line between submission and the rest. Submission is something you do willingly. The rest is something you do under protest. Okay? Now, because the word marriage means rule, that it's the man's house. I know this is going to be controversial. I know y'all ain't going to like this at all. Because the man is the head of the house, then the house is his. Don't matter what the things say on the deed. That's the legal aspect. You can put you to sign the name on anything. But as far as God is concerned, that house belongs to that man. And anything that comes into it is under his authority. Okay. Now, like I say, I know y'all ain't gonna like this. Y'all ain't gonna like this. Women, if you get your BA, your MA, your PhD, the minute you get married, your degrees are in your, your degrees are employed in the building of that man's house. This is why you take his last name. And I and for all you people, all you women who are hyphenators, guess what? Pick a side. Either you're going to stay your maiden self or you're going to go under this man's uh, go under this man's authority. Okay? See people, see people think that they can mix and mess up this marriage thing. No, marriage is established by God and it's by him that if there's going to be any alterations, additions or changes, he's the one that's going to make it. Not you. So everything that comes into that house goes under the man's authority for him to decide and delegate what happens to it. Now, how do wise husbands run their houses? How do wise husbands run their houses? Wise husbands run their houses based on what? What he knows about his wife. Now, it, 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 it can get convoluted if you go to the left with this, but let's stay with this. 
anybody who has a team, all of the players have an integral and important part and role to play on that team. Okay. The captain not playing every position. So everybody's got a position to play. And so what the captain does is the captain finds the best person to play whatever role in that team dynamic. So what does a wise husband do? I know it, it, this, this is my, my testimony. I found that, that because I am expeditious in bill paying, that I handle the money. I don't play with it. When the check comes, I pay what I need to pay. Boom. Okay. It doesn't always work out, but I pray to God, which is, I, I pray to God to put those things in perspective and put those things in priority. So that way my wife doesn't have to worry about that. However, there are some things that she is responsible for. And I let allow her to do those things. Now, a wise husband looks and, and takes his wife and they, as they communicate and talk and, and inter, interact, whatever roles she gravitates toward, that's what he allows her to do. And the minute she takes authority over that, he steps back and doesn't tell her what to do. He doesn't micromanage. He allows her to do what her hands find to do because that's her area of giftedness. He didn't give it to her. God gave it to her. So he respects the godliness that's in her. And he allows her to perform there, if that makes any sense. All right? Now, the reason why this is so important is because the man, just like the priest, has to be free to hear from God to get direction for the family. Remember, marriage is not ours. It's God's. So when you get in there, God is the one navigating and steering. The ones that fail, God stopped navigating. God stop steering. God stop. God stop being the source of 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 uh, reconciliation. He stopped being the source of of wisdom. He stopped being the source of direction. Okay, and I'm say this emphatically. Okay, there are some things you need to be in order to have a solid marriage. <laughs> Excuse me, in order to have <clears throat> a solid relationship within the construct of marriage, not a boyfriend girlfriend thing. All right, so. He's saying, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands in the same manner as you would submission to God. So as you improve your submission to God, then he's telling you that's the way you submit to your husband. And it doesn't mean critique his performance. It doesn't mean always being judgmental. It doesn't mean always keeping his performance under the microscope. And it doesn't mean counting the pennies. I want to hear, I want you to tell, I want you to know that. The marital relationship ain't based on dollars and cents. It's based on a spiritual connection. And if you want money, then what you do is you submit to your husband. God deals with your husband because remember something. He's the provider. And stop wanting for so much. Okay. Because the way if a man, the man of God understands that what his family needs comes through him. Okay. Come through him. Even in the place that the woman has advanced degrees and has a career and is making all this money. The very fact that she's in that prosperous place is because she's under the umbrella of somebody who has acquired favor. Y'all not listening to me. All right. Now, this is why you need to submit to him. Verse 23, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife. What does that mean, Bishop, the head of the wife? He's responsible for your movements as a family. You ain't responsible for what you think. What you think is your problem, okay? Remember something. God does not take something from someone and give it to someone else if it violates their will. You still have a will. You still have a, a deci You have decisions to make in respect to this relationship, okay? And this is, and this is why, as relationship consultants, we see so many people heading for divorce court. It's because they don't understand that simple concept. You're still a person in this uh, in, in this paradigm. You need to be the best person you can be so that when you put this thing inside the marital construct, you can play the best role you can in order to make that thing give God the glory. So it says, the husband is the head of the wife and he is the savior of the body. Listen here, 
I was listening to a guy, I listened to a guy regular, his name is Kevin Samuels. And he says, listen here, men built the world. The world that women are living in is built by men. Okay? Are you listening? Whenever something happens in the house, who do they look for? They look for the man. Now, in the black community, there's a challenge because a lot of times the men are not there. Okay? And that's a whole nother subject. But understand, we're talking about in the confines of a relationship that has entered into the marital construct. All right. It says he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every thing. Now, you might you might have your gun out and you might have your dark out getting ready to shoot darks at Reverend. But guess what? I didn't write that. I didn't write that. So if you get mad at that, there's one thing it says. It says you don't need to get married. Point blank, period. Marriage is not about sex. If you make it about sex, you already fail. And your children are already going to be uh, are going to be deficient socially because you're going to end up breaking up. Your children are going to end up with all of these. It's just too bad. It's too much of a problem for the children for you to get together with this faulty premise that sex is 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 central. No, sex is there for reproduction. See? We as Christians have to get to that place that we look at this thing the way God's looking at it. Everything has an inherent purpose. Now, does sex feel good? Yes. Why does he make it feel good? So you'll do it. If it was painful, you wouldn't do it. Well, some folks won't. Okay? Anything that's painful, you try to avoid. So God makes those things that are essential to you feel good. Now, food, eating, feels good, doesn't it? Okay, defecating feels good, don't it? Urinating feels good, doesn't it? Why? Because he does that so that you can get rid of that trash in a pleasant way. That's the way you know that you're you're succeeding in your human physical body. So those pleasures, those the, that sensuousness that you feel, the reason why it's like that, and the women are more sensitive than the men so that she will feel wanted and loved and cared for so that she will be able to make this transition between making her own decisions for herself and dealing with the mess to being in some place where somebody is covering her. Someone is making her feel wanted and special and important. Free from all of the outside influences. I remember when I was younger, a woman would walk down the street and she wasn't identified by herself. If she was married, she was identified by her husband. Oh, that's so-and-so's wife right there. Oh, that's so-and-so's wife right there. Okay? Okay? That's so-and-so's wife right there. You better not mess with her. That's so-and-so's wife. And especially if that guy was notorious. Okay? Somebody who was in the streets. Somebody who was part of the crime or criminal element. You mess with that man's wife, you might you might end up in a casket. Then there was the guy, the women who were the wives of pastors and ministers. There were certain things you did around those women. Why? Because their covering provided them with the 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 famousness that made it so that people didn't mess with them. Nowadays, too much twerking and tattooing going on. Okay. Too much of that. So men look at women these days as buckets of lust. And that's what they expect from you because the, the majority, a great deal of your peers, women, a great deal of your peers have desecrated womanhood. Desecrated it. Just trashed it. So now a man got to figure out what a real woman is. Got to figure out. Matter of fact, sometimes he have to figure out if it is a woman. Are y'all listening? All right. So watch this. He said, submit to your own husbands in everything. Now, I want to make this clear, ladies. If your husband is not the pastor, listen here. If your husband is not the pastor, what your husband says overrides the pastor. 
Oh, I know that stung. What your husband says overrides the pastor. Okay, because you are not in a marital relationship with the pastor. You're in a marital relationship with your husband. Okay, and guess what? To have a relationship with your pastor that makes him the authority over your house is a form of idolatry. And when your marriage fails, idolatry to a husband equates to adultery. You have in your head added sometimes added somebody else to this relationship. And so yeah, when a, when a man's authority is threatened, you can expect him to to fire back. I'm just having to say it right here, all right? So these are the commands of God to the women. First, submit yourselves unto your own husbands in the same way as the Lord, and okay. Submit yourselves to your husbands in everything. If you don't like the way you dress, sorry about that. You should have thought about that before you made this promise. Okay. Now, let me take, let me pump my brakes real quick. We're halfway through. There are some things you all need to discuss before you make the vow. Okay. Are you listening? The one thing he, you need to discuss is what does my husband expect from me? No, generally, what does a husband expect? Not just a boyfriend or some guy that wants to get involved in this marital situation. I'm talking about my husband, the one that I can submit to, the one that I, okay, that if, that if this person walks up to me tomorrow, will I recognize him? And I'm going to tell you, men are simple creatures. Tell you what he don't care nothing about. Are you ready? Hope you're sitting down, got your notebook. He don't care about makeup. Not even a consideration. He doesn't care about your weave or your hairstyle. Doesn't care. Does not care about your college degrees. Those things are not even requisite. Doesn't care about what kind of car you drive. Don't care about what kind of friends you have. The only thing the man is concerned about is that which pertains to his household. Your degree pertains to you, not the household. If you are using that degree to improve his, his household, then okay, bring it. But you could come in there without it. Y'all are not listening to me. He requires a person to be healthy. He requires a woman that is generally happy. He requires a woman that genuinely wants to be with him. Not interested in the body counts. He doesn't care. In fact, the higher the body count, the closer you get to disqualification. Okay. Men, as a rule, are always looking toward the permanency of marriage. I don't care what man that is. It's always at the root of his thinking. Now, if he's been traumatized, if he's been um, been uh, legalized, if he's going through some legal trauma with the state, between you and the state, and, and he's going through a bunch of trouble, he may talk against marriage. But at the root of it, he really does want to be in it. He wouldn't have gotten with you if he didn't want to. Okay, men are very straightforward. Anything we don't want to do, we don't do. So that cancels out all of the other extra. So if you got if you got butt selfies on Instagram and 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 on Facebook and all that kind of stuff, if you're on if you're on the social media fighting and arguing and stuff, you have pretty much disqualified yourself from being married to a good guy. Because he don't it, it, all that's extra, all that's extra, and a lot of it to him is sickening. Okay, now. Here's another problem with that. If you present sex to the man in the beginning, that's what he's gonna, that's what he's gonna gauge as your personality. And you might try to, oh well, that's not all I am, but that's what you showed me first. See? That's what you showed me first. If that's your lead off, then that's how he's gonna judge it. So if you lead off showing him intelligence and, and duty is and, and being dutiful and being industrious, that's what he sees first. Now, I hear a lot of talk about the 
uh, the uh, um, Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. Let me tell you something about her. Okay. Household first. She took care of her family. She was industrious. She had a skill set. She had a she had something that was marketable that she could use to uplift and upbuild her family. She had total confidence in her ability to not only create but to sell. She had a she did everything she did in order to make her family happy. As a result, check this out: the her husband was known among the elders of the land. So her conduct got him a promotion. Y'all are not listening to me, okay? So, so you, if you wanted to liken yourself to that woman, then you got to meet those requirements. But remember something: men are real simple. So if you want to stay in a relationship with a man, just just keep it simple. That's all, okay? If you still gotta, if you still gotta have the red bottoms and you still got to deal with the vanity piece, trust me on that. You got men looking at you. You gotta, your ego is getting all twisted up. You're gonna run into a situation where that guy is attractive to you, and you're gonna gravitate. Okay, you might not say it in the open, but in your mind. Okay, and trust me, it's going to affect what you do with your husband. All right, so much for that. We'll have more in other sessions. Now, <clears throat> this is the man's role. It says, husbands, love your wives. So if God has to tell you something, that's where you're short. So we can conclude by this right here, that the women have a problem with submission and the men have a problem with love. So if the man is loving the wife, then chances are she won't have a problem submitting. Okay? Because love is the thing that brings this all together. So if the husband's loving his wife, it says, love the wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. All right? Let's stop right there. That's a whole lot. So let's make this make sense. The word sanctify means to set apart. Okay? Set apart. Imagine going to an apple orchard. Okay? You go into an apple orchard. And we know that toward the top of the tree are the larger apples. You know why? Because they're closer to the sun. See? So choosing the wife is like going into the apple orchard and looking for that one apple, that one apple that's the perfect size, the perfect color, the perfect shape, don't have any bugs, the bugs haven't been eating it, the birds haven't pecked it. You pull it down and you take it and you say this is, is mine. Isn't that what Adam did in the garden? He said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Gave her an identity. Okay? So husbands, the first thing to do, you take that you take that woman and you make her yours. I, this is mine. Flesh of my flesh. Now, women, you have to understand that the word marriage means to rule. So if he takes you under his leadership, then he has to be able to tell you what to do. If you're not a listener, if you're not, if, if you're a rebel, then, then guess what? He might cut that apple open and find a worm inside. And that happens from time to time. Even the best looking apples can have worms in them. Okay. So the real good, high quality apples have gone through an x-ray to see if there's not something living on the inside. Are you listening? All right. So he takes her and then he says, and he cleanses it with the washing of the water by the word. In other words, he gives you instruction. He gives you instruction. Is that not what Adam was supposed to do for Eve? He gave her the instructions. She embellished. Okay. He didn't tell her not to touch the food. He said, just don't eat it. Are you listening? <clears throat> she could have picked it, handled it, put it on the display, put it on a necklace, put it, you could have done anything on all the stuff. But the minute she took the bite, that's when the problem happened. Are you listening? All right. So, <clears throat> He said that he might present it to himself. A glorious church. This is, this is Jesus, the work of Jesus. Jesus gave his life for the church so that he could pull the church out of the hands of the enemy. 
okay? And put the church under his protection, under his guardianship, under his guidance, under his authority. So once it's his, the enemy has to go to him to mess with it. Or oh, y'all are not listening to me. The church becomes part of the household of God. And because of that, in order to get to it, he has to go past the strong man, which is Christ. And Christ is not going to let, he said, if, if, if it's in my hand, ain't nobody pulling it out. So now he got a problem because Christ done pulled the whole church into and under his care. Same thing a husband got to do. Pull that woman out of the degradation and crap of the world, out of the system, and give her some education. Honey, I love you to death. Let me show you what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. Let me show you how to get a blessing. Let me show you how to get strong in the Lord. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how to do that. Now, if she comes in already domestic, then his half of his battle's done. Okay? But if not, guess what? He may have to hope he got some cooking skills. I know <clears throat> I was blessed. I'm blessed because my wife's a cook. Okay? But had it not been that, I would have been teaching her how to cook. Teach her how to make meatloaf. Teach her how to make steak. Teach her how to make, you know, spaghetti. Teach her how to make all these different things. Why? Because the man, now that he's under, she's under, he has to tell her how things should go in this house so that she can function. It is what it is. Okay? Now, he had to do this. And he had to what? When he cleanses it by the word, there's neither spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. Now, <clears throat> he's real specific. He's real specific. Stains are indicative of sin. Wrinkles are typical of bad conduct. Okay? So what does the word do for you? The word changes your behavior. The word helps to help you subdue those things which produce sinful acts, change in the mind. See, it's just like you take some bleach. You got a white stain. You got a stain on your white sheet. You take some bleach. You get the stain out. Okay. This is what the word does. <clears throat> what it also does is it gives the woman the idea and of, of what kind of leadership she's going to be under for the rest of her life. This man cares enough about me to make sure I understand these concepts. Now, a real man understands that a woman has a brain and that he, ain't in, he, he might be in full control, but he doesn't exercise, he doesn't need to, okay? He don't have to call home for work, all right, da, 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 da. If he goes out on Saturday, all right, laundry done. See, he never has to call his wife and check out. Even though, yeah, sometimes wives find it necessary to call and check on their husbands. What time are you coming home? When you want to do this? No, oh, no, no, no. Y'all need to stop that. Okay? You know, because you're starting a bad trend. People checking on each other just because they need to know. It ain't none of your business. If there's something going to happen out of ordinary, if you, if you believe you have a good husband, your husband will let you know when something is not ordinary. Let that man do what he does. Anyway, let's keep it moving. All right? Now, the reason he does all this so it could be holy, holy, set apart, special, okay, clean, holy, and without blemish. That's what the word of God does. So the difference between the legal link up in the world and marriage is this. They both have the same emphasis. They both carry the same weight in the eyes of people. But the marriage is governed by God's word. Remember, it's his institution. So in order for you to stay in it, you all are going to have to be going by the same rule and conduct. And it's the man that's supposed to spearhead that. This is how we do in, in our house. Look at what Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will do what? Serve the Lord. So the idea is if you decide you don't want to serve this God, you might, you might end up out. Solomon had a problem with that. Every time there was a pretty girl, he'd let her set up her idol in the house. Not very smart. Anyway, let's keep it moving. And it says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. 
he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Listen here carefully. When we make the transition between the Bible days and now, there are some guys that don't love themselves. So we don't, <laughs> that's why women, you gotta be careful because there's some guys that might do some things that demonstrate to you that they're all about themselves, but they're not, okay? No way, no reason you get into a criminal enterprise and you say you care about yourself. No reason you'll get involved in all of the craziness of the world and following worldly trends and you say you love yourself. <laughs> Leaders want to magnify leadership traits. In other words, they're always working on something that's going to make them better, okay? Make them stronger, give them more fame and respect, have their families in a better position, always improving and escalating and elevating. That's the real man. But some of these guys just don't love themselves. <clears throat> okay. And at some point, you are going to have to get the advice of a righteous man in your bloodline or a righteous man in your church to check this guy out. Why? Because remember something, till you get married, God is your father and God is taking the care of you. So when a man decides he's going to marry you. This is why God have to give him favor because he's passing the baton to the husband. Y'all ain't listening to me. That's going to be another teaching. All right. So he said he loveth his wife, loveth himself. So when you see a guy doing for his wife, guess what? It's a demonstration that he really loves himself because they're part. He's, she's part of his body now. She's part of his body now. I got a little bit of a a skin tag. And you know what? I don't hate my skin tag. I'd rather it not be there. But guess what? I really I, I wash it just like I wash everything else. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if it starts giving me some trouble, I, I, I try to relieve it just like everything else. And I don't and, and I don't insult it at all. See, there are some times when 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 men are gonna have to learn what's important, what's not important. There are some things not even important for you to argue about. OK, just leave it alone. OK, you said you love the woman. Go ahead and love the woman. What that little thing you're concerned about ain't nothing. It's not a doggone thing. Anyway. All right. Now, watch this. Verse 29, it says, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it. And it, it even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body, the flesh of his flesh of his flesh and of his bones. All right. Now, look at the word nourisheth. If you're reading the King James Version, it said nourisheth, cherisheth, E-T-H. Love that suffix, people. Love it. Love it to death. You know why? Because it means continually, Un indefinitely, okay? So we reread this word, reread the words. It says... For no man ever hated his own flesh, but he continually and indefinitely nourishes it. And indefinitely and, and and nourish it. Indefinitely and without time end. Until time ends, ETH. Continually, without end. Ch cherishes. How do you cherish your wife? When a man looks at his wife, there are certain things he should see. If he'd been away from her all day, she needs a hug. That's just all there is to that. She needs one. Are you listening, guys? She needs it. That should be your lead off. I know my wife. Listen, I've been with my wife all this long. I know that she misses me. I ain't got to question that. So when I come in the house, I'm reaching for the cheek. I'm reaching for, if she's standing up, I'm reaching for the body. That's all the rest of that. Give her a nice hug. Give her a nice hug, too. Bury my neck, my face right between her, right in her neck area. And show her that she's valuable to me. I watch what she does around the house. And I, and I, I give her compliments at Odd times. You know, I saw that thing you were doing in there. That's awesome. 
shoot, you could make you could you could make a pretty lucrative income with that. You know what I mean? Always encouraging, always complimenting, and it's not to blow our head up, but it's just things you recognize. See, so men, we need to soften up some, just a little, just enough that she understands that you include her and in, and in she's in your heart. Okay, now. He constantly nourishes, constantly cherishes. And watch this. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Okay? Now, the spiritual connection between two people, that can happen whether you are in in, in proximity or not. But the physical connection should directly reflect the spiritual one. Are you listening? If you care about someone, the way that they know it is that you do a particular thing that demonstrates that. If you all are connected, then there are some things that's going to happen. There's times when you're going to finish each other's sentences. There's going to be times when you know, a, you look over at them and they know that you want to say something. Specifically, is there something you want to ask me or is there something you need to say? There's there's always that connection, see? And then you really never have to ask what's going on with your partner if that spiritual connection is there, okay? But because you all are in the flesh, you have to be made aware that once the man takes the rulership and gains this favor, she becomes connected to him like the rest of his body parts, like Siamese twins joined at the heart. Are you listening? That makes real good sense to me. All right. So let me tell you some things about marriage in the legal sense. Then we're going to wrap this up. Because of the social tone, I want you to understand this and listen to this very carefully. If you're not married, when you go down to the courthouse or wherever to pick up your marriage license, I want you to understand something is that nobody should be able to license you to do what God already ordained. I want you to hear that carefully. If you if, if you want to go and give your, your family to the state, then you go right ahead. Okay. That's up to you. Because as soon as you sign that marriage license, the state becomes the third party in your marriage. And so all the children become wards of the state. Don't believe it? You look it up, you look it up and you'll see. So this is my position. My position is strong churches need to be established to monitor and to mediate, moderate over God's institutions, all of them. Marriage childbirth, education, all of those, okay? And what should happen is the church should be the one to issue the notarized certificate. The Catholic church used to do it. In fact, there was times when if a person wanted to have a divorce, they had to go to the Catholic church to get a, a sanctioned a, annulment. They call it an annulment. They had to go to the church in order to get it. Why are we not doing it now? Because the church belongs to the state. Any church with a 501c3 belongs to the state. I don't care what you say. It's it's legal. It, you got you to gotta read contract law in order to understand it. So the, the fact that the church is not the head of family life, it, it, it contributes to the fact, you know, to the fact that these marriages fail. They have no center. They have no center. Remember, the church is supposed to be Jesus supposed to be married to Jesus. And if it's married to Jesus, then it's directly connected to God. And if you get married in a church, then your marriage should be governed by God, not the state. <clears throat> so I've made it, I, in, in this ministry here, I tell, them, I tell people who want to get married, listen, this is what you do. If you decide that you want to get a license, you go ahead. But I would rather give you a writ of marriage. A writ of marriage is more legally binding and it keeps your marriage out of the state's hands, okay? And what does that entail? 
That entails everything that you two promise to each other. It starts with the construct of God's marriage construct and what that entails. And then you tell, you tell each other what you are promising in detail according to the word of God which means that you need to have some teaching in the church so that you will know what you what what you're supposed to be doing okay now here's the kicker if you do it that way it's permanent now you could try to go to a court <laughs> you could try to go to a court and have them and no, no, that ain't gonna work you got to go back to the church which means that the church is always going to encourage you to stay together. So if you want a permanent relationship, you get a you get a writ of marriage, not a license. Does that make sense? In fact, husbands, you should encourage your wives to get the writ because the writ lasts in perpetuity. See, anything you offer in that writ automatically goes to her. Automatically. There's no probate. There's no, listen, if you promise something to your wife, when you go, she'll get it. Point blank, period. Your kids, any subsequent kids, ch grandchildren. In fact, your that writ of marriage can also be a party in a last will and testament. It covers most of that anyway. Okay. Now, if you want more questions about that, I'll put my email in the chat. So we want to bring back the tradition of marriage, even though we live in a more eclectic time. The, the principles still work. The principles still are there of making husbands be more responsible, helping the women to make better choices in husbands, having the proper guidance so that this is what I often tell people. The marital institution is perfect. You are just trying to fit your relationship inside that construct. Okay to get all of its benefits. If you have a deficiency, it's just like it's just like trying to put a round peg in a square hole. You know, you put the, the it's going to touch on four all four sides, but there's going to be spaces. Okay? As you grow, you fill those spaces. And that's when God gets the glory. When your marriage looks like it should look in heaven. When your marriage looks like the marriage between Christ and the church. That's when God gets the glory, okay? He don't get the glory because you say so. He don't get the glory because you went and gave your marriage away to the state. He don't get the glory because you made this, this, this half-hearted promise based on sex and based on all these other factors, okay? He gets the glory when you understand that it, it, he, he put it in his will that man should not be alone. He provided a suitable helper. The suitable helper is submitting to the authority of the man. He is taking full charge over her, protecting her, leading her, guarding her, caring for her, cherishing her, nurturing her. Okay? And she, in turn, is reciprocating by what? Offering totally herself. That's it for today. Tomorrow's going to be a beast. Okay? Because we got to go into some of these concepts a little bit more intrinsically. And so that you'll understand how, how you can put yourself in the best position. If you're looking for a husband, to get one. If you're looking for a wife, how to find one. All right? Let us pray. Father, we're thankful today because you are God all the time. And you are good all the time. Even though we see calamities happening, Father, we know that we know you engineered the weather but we know that you did not have it in your plan for people to be destroyed. Father, we're thankful that you have allowed Hurricane Ida to pass. She's back in the ocean now. Father, right now, we'd like to just, just say thank you for the lives that were spared. And we, if you could, give grace to the families of those who were lost. Father, help us to be more benevolent, that we might help those who are, have need at this time. Father, help those who are suffering with COVID-19. Father, help those who are suffering any type of way today, but especially help those in the marital relationship. 
Help them to be stronger. Help them to gravitate toward the truth of your marital relationship and get away from the falsehood that has been keeping them from uniting and being one in the flesh and in the spirit. Father, if you could, we'd, we'd like some grace in many areas. And I'm sure that as a loving father, that you are willing to give those things to us. Help us to be more willing to submit ourselves to you that we might give our sins away and get rid of those things that are causing us to miss the mark. And Father, we're just thankful in advance for those things that you're going to do on the rest of today. Because we know that if you're involved, it's going to be perfect. You said your promises are yea and amen. You also told us that if we stayed in the word and the word stayed in us, we could ask for what we will. You told us that if we came to you and we asked in faith and we didn't waver, that you would give us what we desired according to your will. Father, you said where there are two or more touching and agreeing that you are here in the midst. And you also told us, look at all these promises, Lord, we just thank you. You told us that if we were asking for something while we were in the state of agreement, that you would do it for us. So, Father, there are many things we need and many things we want. And so as you grow this broadcast and you grow this line, we're going to be careful and grateful to circulate good things among us and to be the kind of people that you are calling for even though we are having issues and, and challenges with behavior and with our thought processes, we know that if we stay in your word, that we'll be better. We'll get cleansed. We'll get sanctified. We'll be made holy because you told us to be holy as you are holy. So Father, as we go forward, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do on the rest of the day because it is by the authority given to me by your son, Jesus, that I bring this petition. And all who agreed with the prayer said in their hearts and out loud, amen. All right, folks, it's been a blessing. I will see you tomorrow at 12. Tell all your friends. If you're on YouTube, like the video, share the video, subscribe to my YouTube page. If you're on Facebook, go to the Church of the Ascended Christ page and like that page. We are starting to have studies on that page regular um if you are you know send me a friend's request and we'll we'll make this connection i am also on twitter go on twitter and follow this broadcast and we will all be blessed together there's some things we want to talk about we want to talk about building a community we want to talk about helping our children we want to talk about building strong saved righteous relationships so that when the state is doing its craziness, we can be a force and a light on the planet. You all be blessed. This is Dr. Timothy Hart signing off. You all have a great day.